SDK webinars. Uh, thanks, Valeria. So welcome back to Polycon UK. Um, we're very, very happy today to have Vera with us. But before we get started, let me um, just say a couple of words. We are just restarting the series. We'll have an exciting set of webinars coming up, which you can find on our website. So please do go out there and um, check out the program. Um, we'll, we're on 3 p.m. every two weeks, except for when there are Easter holidays uh, this term. Um, the information is also circulated on Twitter, so do follow us there as well. Um, the rules of the seminar stay the same, 60 minutes. Vera is very happy to take questions throughout, so feel free to you know, raise your hand or interrupt politely um, to make sure that, uh, that you get your questions to Vera um, throughout the talk. And yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to Vera. The screen is yours. Thank you so much for accepting our, um, for accepting our, uh, our invitation. And yeah, looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, really excited to be back in the UK, even though just virtually. I haven't been back for a while now. Um, yeah, and uh, also very happy to present uh, this project. It is uh, super new, so it's the first time I'm presenting this, and I thought uh, with this type of audience, it's really great because I can get a lot of feedback. Um, at the moment, it's very empirical, so it's mostly data-driven, but um, I would be all ears if anybody has any ideas how to potentially have a nice little model to model this as well, theoretically. So, and of course, empirically, um, there are no cute ident identification strategies, so don't get excited yet, uh, but we have really cool data. And, um, and so also on this side, I would be super happy if there, uh, were in, uh, uh, there was some input and uh, some questions. Um, so, um, so we are basically looking at, um, you know, this vastly developing field of gender and politics. So the question of descriptive and substantive representation of women and of course also issues that affect women more. Um, and so we wanted to actually look into the relationship between not just female representation, but how women, once they are represented in parliaments and legislatures, how they actually ac access um, power positions in the political decision making process. So what we are doing here is a joint project with Bettina Fetcher, who is a postdoc here at the University of Hamburg, and Philip Mano, who is a professor at the University of Bremen. Um, so we are looking actually at German state parliament since 1948, and we have really great individual level data for MPs. Um, and so, so this is our basis, and um, I will uh, talk about this a little bit more. So just give me a quick outline. So I would just want to talk a little bit uh, about the context, of course, focus on the literature. We have some thoughts on theoretical arguments, but they are not yet formalized. Um, then I talk a little bit about the data we have and that we are looking at. I show you some descriptive results, which in itself are already very interesting and uh, give us some more puzzles to deal with. And then I show you some um, regression results and uh, talk about uh, further steps we are taking. So this is just uh, by way of introducing this topic. Um, as you know, you know, female representation in legislatures across European Parliament has increased over time. This is just a snapshot of what ha what happened, uh, what, what uh, national parliaments in the European Union look like in 2020. As you can see, it's on average about 30 percent. So a third of parliamentarians are women, but this varies greatly um, across uh, European countries. And uh, we see that Germany is very close to the average with about 31% of female, um, uh, uh, female parliamentarians, female members of parliament. But um, as we might expect, or as is obvious, that there is a huge distinction between uh, descriptive representation, so access to uh, to uh, uh, the legislature, and then also influencing policy making through different channels. So what we, for example, know is that uh, uh, still in terms of executive power, um, uh, no, uh, in terms of power positions in parliaments, um, 23 out of the 28 national parliaments uh, in the EU have a mayor president um, uh, in 2019. 
um, only if, uh, about 30%, but more than 30% of female parliamentarians also um, have then or are ac uh, have access to um, governmental or executive political positions. Um, and when we look even at those women who have these types of uh, positions, uh, what we see is that uh, when you look, for example, at ministries and ministers, uh, secretaries and so on, and what you see is that uh, uh, women are concentrated in areas and ministry, uh, ministries that focus on social cultural functions, right? So like the family ministry, the health ministry, the education ministry, and so on. And but they are significantly underrepresented with about 30% in more economy related functions. So the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Economics, but also the Ministry of um, uh, Domestic uh, Affairs and so on, right? Um, so this is an executive position. When we look at parliamentary committees where parliamentary decision making takes place and, uh, and decisions or pre preparation of uh, legislative output, um, what we see is that there the discrepancy is even greater. So this might already descriptively point to the fact that, you know, executive positions are much more visible and therefore also that uh, there's more opportunism or what we would call affirmative action play, right? So it is important to have female ministers uh, in the government because that can be seen by the voters. And if voters have a general preference for gender equality or an increased preference for gender equality, then, uh, then this is, uh, should be visible mostly in governmental positions. So when we look at, um, at uh, uh, chairs of parliamentary committees with economic functions, which would be um, um, legislative committees, for example, including finance, trade, industry, agriculture, and so forth, then we see that here women are much more underrepresented or there's a lower share of women in these positions, right? So on average, it's 25% uh, it's of women um, sharing or are presidents of these legislative committees. But you can also see from this picture that there is huge variance across, uh, across, uh, across EU um, countries. Again, when we look at uh, uh, chairs of parliamentary committees that have a more Sociocultural function again, for example, health, education, social affairs, um, family, culture, sports. Then you see that there the female representation is relatively close to that um, of uh, uh, women in uh, that occupy these types of ministries, right? So you could actually, at a first glance, uh, think that uh, women are pushed in low profile committees and ministries and men if they can actually um, occupy more high profile committees and ministries. And uh, this is important and we will argue that especially these high profile committees and um, economics related committees are really important to a career path. And uh, that's why there is uh, potentially more competition going on. So what we really want to want to understand is um, why does uh, political influence, and we are looking at legislative influence more particularly, um, is not proportional to numeric representation of women in uh, in legislatures. So um, so we will focus uh, theoretically, um, or at least starting to focus on uh, questions as uh, why are legislative committees um, important channels for political influence and uh, individual political careers. So this is something, of course, that is important. If that is the case, then, of course, that would establish some competition and potentially room for discrimination. Right. Um, but when we see these kind of, uh, kinds of data, of course, the first thing that everybody would shout is, OK, there's discrimination going on. And of course, we want to unpack this uh, just a little bit and understand, can we disentangle potential discrimination from um, other sources of committee assignment? OK. 
Um, this is like when we look at the gender pay gap, right? Of course, uh, when we just see the gender pay gap, it's relatively large when we control for questions of expertise, experience, and competence, then it shrinks quite substantively. And we believe this uh, might be very, very similar in, uh, in these cases. Um, so that we, we have to therefore strictly differentiate between entering, so just descriptive representation and influencing politics, right? So we want to focus on one channel of decision making power, which is legislative power. And we, we argue that most of the legislative uh, decision making is really, or, or the, the real work is done in legislative committees. So, so what, what the goal of this project is, is, uh, as I said before, whether it is possible to disentangle discrimination slash self-selection, that's uh, uh, economists like to euphemistically call discrimination often self-selection, especially when you look at uh, labor economics. Um, um, it might be very difficult to actually disentangle discrimination from self-selection, but we want to at least uh, on the one side actually look at discrimination and or self-selection versus what we would call competence, right? And competence not just measured um, as traditionally with uh, education, but also thinking about expertise in terms of occupation, uh, professional expertise, experience, so political experience, and of course, also education, okay? So as I said, this is at the moment mostly an empirical paper. Um, so we um, look at the gender composition of legislative committees in, uh, across German state parliaments, and we have um, very unique individual level data for members of par for individual members of parliament of all G German state uh, uh, legislators since 1948. Um, just as a little preview, what what have we found so far um, is that. Um, as we have seen in the beginning, this all holds true for Germany as well, that women are less likely to enter committees uh, that we would call high profile. And I talk a little bit more how we would measure high profile. So committees with mostly economic functions, um, and they're more likely to enter committees which have a lower profile. And again, I will talk about what we mean by that uh, with, uh, or with social uh, cultural functions. Um, we see that, for example, experience um, is a relatively strong predictor. Um, it matters for some committee membership, but not so much for others. Um, so, but it clearly, there's clearly room, it leaves room for discrimination. So we cannot, we cannot explain um, the gender assignment to uh, committees by um, all the things that we can measure and control for, like education experience and um, and um, and expertise. Um, then once uh, the community assignment has taken place, uh, we look at hierarchies within committees, so who becomes the committee chair. And here um, we don't find so much gender assignment or not anymore after we actually control for competence experience and expertise. So there is, of course, uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, gender and politics literature has boomed, right? So there are so many papers and books on this that I focus a little bit in, not just on, or I do not look at all, or do not recount here at all literature or papers on female representation, but really just on uh, things that are closer related to what we want to do and questions of women in decision-making positions and uh, but then more, even more specifically uh, gender assignment to, um, to legislative committees. Um, so what we, what we know from, the, from previous papers and the literature is that uh, the number of women shrinks as we move up the political hierarchy, right? So there's uh, you are members of parliament, but not potentially members of important committees, much less so chairs of important committees. And uh, then we see the same at, at, at party leadership levels, um, faction leadership levels, and so on. 
Um, we are, as I said before, women are primarily assigned to ministries reflecting what, what one can call euphemistically women's issues, such as health, social welfare, education, family, culture, and consumer affairs, paper by a uh, relatively early paper by Davis from 97. Um, what we observe, um, and Diana O'Brien and Tiffany Barnes have worked on this uh, question a lot um, in the past uh, five to 10 years, um, that we observe currently shifts in these gender patterns, but only when, um, when the meanings of functions fundamentally change, right? So when migration becomes more important, it's not just women who, who are moved in the migration committees, but men take over, right? The same, same as health, right? So uh, when a health crisis hits like COVID, then this is a really salient topic. And so uh, health ministries and health committees are actually occupied more by women. So there are shifts in gender patterns depending on the salience and uh, importance of uh, these different committees. Um, um, uh, female lawmakers uh, still struggle to become full and equal members of the policymaking process, also by O'Brien and Piscopo, a recent paper from 2019. And um, uh, there's also uh, great variation across different countries uh, in women's access to ministerial power. Um, and then there's a nice paper by Fol Folke and Wigner that basically shows that, uh, again, there is this leaking pipe problem in uh, political hierarchies, um, however, uh, even conditional on observable qualification, right? So we still find uh, this leaking pipe problem once we have control for competence and qualifications. So more specifically, uh, women in legislative committees. Um, um, so uh, Barnes and also Borchardt show that uh, really membership on powerful committees is a source of political influence and affect political careers. Um, so, uh, so for example, in uh, there's a paper by Kaiser that shows for the German case that the majority of cabinet members since 1949 have been uh, chairs uh, or uh, members of uh, very important standing committees and parliamentary groups before. Um, so women hold fewer chamber-wide powerful committee leadership than men, um, and uh, and uh, this even sometimes uh, so the, the assignment to powerful uh, positions even uh, declines when the share of women for so the descriptive representation of women in parliament increases. So, so there is quite a lot of evidence, and uh, but I want to move on uh, what we want to do here. So as I said, main uh, puzzle is why does descriptive representation does not translate into more political power of women. Um, and, uh, and we want to see whether we can differentiate between discrimination and competence. Um, so um, just theoretically or also empirically, of course, why do committees matter for policymaking? Um, we focus, as I said, on German state parliament, but uh, the German parliament is actually a working parliament, right? So it's one of the typical working parliaments. Um, so the work in committees really lie, lies at the heart of parliamentary activities. Um, so the work in the committees prepares uh, uh, the decision of the parliament. So all draft legislation is discussed in uh, according committees, right? So all proposals will be assigned to one or more committees, usually the area committee. So if it's a proposal regarding migration and go, it goes to the migration committee and to the law and finance committee, right? So it has to be, um, uh, checked for whether it's constitutional and whether it's actually commensurable with the budget, right? So this is kind of usually how assignment works. Um, so com uh, in committees, committee members usually make and discuss amendments or uh, amended proposals and uh, they solve conflicts between quite often coalition parties, but also 
if you need a larger parliamentary conference, then this is also usually discussed and solved within committees. Um, committees invite and hear experts on specific topics, is, uh, as we know, particularly relevant in areas where expertise is not necessarily within the parliament, like health, um, health issues uh, and so on. Um, so, uh, uh, so the usually committee uh, meetings are public, and so uh, the public also has access to the discussion of draft bills, motions, uh, and so on. Um, and then we also have committees of inquiry, right, uh, that actually uh, are also very important and powerful because they examine uh, possible misgovernment, uh, maladministration, uh, and also a possible misconduct uh, of uh, on the part of politicians, right? Like investigation into Trump um, more recently. Um, so how how do how does committee assignment actually work in uh, in German state parliaments? Um, so usually. Not usually, mostly it is the case that uh, ministries, uh, governmental ministries are mirrored by committees. So you have, you know, for each, each ministry, at least a mirror committee, legislative committee. And then also you have working groups in parliament and, uh, and in the fraction. Um, so seats and also chairs of these legislative committees are distributed proportionally um, to a seat, a seat chair in the legislature, right? So the largest party gets more seats on each committee. And then there's also kind of a rota how you actually um, select chairs. So the largest fraction can choose the committee that they want to propose a chair for first, then the second largest, and so on, and then it starts again. Right? So, uh, so larger parties clearly have uh, more power in selecting uh, chairs of the more important uh, committees. But one could also imagine that, of course, the Greens would always want to have the environmental committee, so they might actually choose to be the chair of that one first. Right? Um, and then parties choose committee members and chairs within an uh, internal uh, process within the party faction. So um, that means that uh, um, access to committees is competitive. There are almost no formal rules within the factions how uh, committee seat allocation is, uh, is actually done, right? Usually that is kind of internal, it's an internal bargaining process. Of course, usually um, members of the party uh, faction in parliament can, can basically announce their preferences, right? But there will be then the faction leadership that allocates um, membership uh, or, or members of the faction to specific committees. So it's really, there's not much information or at least not quantitative information uh, uh, of how factions actually allocate members to, uh, uh, to uh, seats and chairs in committees. Um, so there is a lot of room for competition. There's potentially room also for discrimination. Um, so what we are trying to do now is actually also uh, have interviews to just basically find out what the informal processes are within factions in order to allocate members to committees. Um, so, so, so clearly also within the committees, there is a hierarchy. So the chairs of the committees are really, really important uh, because uh, they determine the place uh, uh, and time of meetings. They set the agenda. They actually distribute uh, speaking rights to members of the committee uh, and so on. So this is really, they also decide um, whether proposed experts are invited or not. So this is a really powerful position within legislative committees. Right, so you have these these two types of importance. So one is the committee area, right? So whether it's finance, economics, law, um, or low profile like family, tourism, culture, uh, and then within the committee is the hierarchy between the chairs and the members. 
Um, so the second thing that is, of course, impo important to create these incentives for competition is that um, committees are really relevant for career building. I've already cited this paper that uh, actually shows that really having important uh, committee positions is important for going on to becoming once if your party actually enters the government actually also um, get governmental positions, so executive positions. Um, on the other hand, uh, we also know, and uh, Mickler 18 has shown that committee membership is really an instrument for party leadership to reward loyalty or punish dissent of its members, right? So actually to uh, quite often enforce uh, party discipline in, in, in the parliament. Um, on the other hand, as I also said before, committees are less visible to the public, right? So, so there is much less incentive for affirmative action and window dressing, which kind of leaves more room for potential discrimination if this is what, what uh, uh, well, if there are unconscious biases and party leaders uh, actually feel that they want to assign or want to give, you know, uh, important positions to their male colleagues. Um, So to the data, right? Um, so the data is uh, a large part of the careers and comparison project that's funded by uh, um, the Swiss National Science Foundation and the German uh, uh, National Science Foundation. Um, so uh, as I said, we have membership in German state legislatures from 1946 to 2019, and it's now even also being updated for the last three years. Um, so it's a huge data collection effort because it's mainly hand coded from handbooks and from um, parliamentary anniversary issues. Um, when data is available on the web, then we also did some web scraping. That means that in the end, we have 12,600 members of state parliaments in our data set, uh, approximately 10,000 male and 2,500 female. Um, of course, these sometimes get re-elected, right, and serve more than one term in parliament. So we have uh, overall almost 30,000 legislative spouts, uh, again, majority male spouts with almost 24,000 and 5,000 female spouts. And then also men on average uh, spend 2.23 terms in parliament, while women spend only 2.04. So there's also there a little bit of a um, difference. So out of those, about 6,500 members of state parliament are members of one or more committees, 5,000 male, 1,500 female, um, and 4,000 have not been assigned to any committee in when they were in parliament. So of course, as you can imagine, uh, how you actually, uh, so if committees mirror uh, ministries, then their area of expertise might be different, right? So sometimes you have a ministry for family and social affairs. Now we have a big ministry for economics and environment, right? So, um, and so what we, what we did is actually because these committee names and issue areas vary um, across uh, state parliaments and uh, legislative periods, um, we identify 18 different committee areas. Um, so one is uh, economics and finance. These are the usual ones. Sometimes economic and finance are, of course, um, together in one big uh, committee. Then we have the judicial, the law committee, agriculture, migration, health, labor, education, environment, research, infrastructure, then domestic affairs, so security, law and order, or, uh, often housing, culture, tourism, Europe, and then committees for um, inquiry. So these are usually ad hoc committees. Um, so for each of the members of parliament, we have information on uh, yeah, individual characteristics, gender, age. We have their biography also in text form. So we have education, occupation, but that means it's very tedious to actually get this out of uh, these, um, these CV entries. Um, their family status, the number of children, um, party membership, of course, that's easy. Then legislative spouts, so how many times they were re-elected, re um, whether there are um, list, um, list candidates or direct um, um, 
um, single member district candidates. Um, and then, of course, we know in what committee they are assigned to and their position within that committee. Okay. So, of course, we all kind of have some idea which committees are important and which committees are not, right? Uh, but we want to move away from just having an idea about this. Um, so we were thinking, how do we identify those low and high status committees? Um, so we know that they uh, mirror mir the um, executive ministries. Um, and uh, so there, there, there is work by Truckman and uh, Warwick, but also by Cook and O'Brien that actually measure committee status by actually looking at uh, portfolio salience, right? So uh, of course, you usually you have the usual suspects: finance, economics, uh, have high salience, families, and culture have relatively low salience. So we use this as a very crude measure to start with. Um, we have started to actually collect uh, um, actually how bills are assigned to these committees across state parliaments, legislatures, and over time. And so what we want to do is look at the number of or the share of bills that is assigned to each committee and use this as uh, as uh, as a measure of salience or importance of committees that allows us to actually also have variation over time and across states. Um, then uh, one might think that potentially the effect of uh, re-election, so the effect of expertise on the likelihood of entering uh, a committee uh, might be actually um, um, a measure for the importance of that committee. We haven't done that yet, but this is an idea to do that. And then um, when you look at, because Germany is a federal state, um, responsibility, there are different responsibilities at the federal and at the state level. So for example, education is a state level responsibility so that education ministry, uh, education should be more important at the state level than it is at the federal level. Um, Clément. Uh, yeah, hi Vera. Um, hi. So could you use here, for example, the probability of being uh, becoming a federal politician uh, given membership of a committee? Because you're thinking of these committees as a, a stepping uh, stone for future political career, right? Yeah, yeah, th yeah that's a great idea. Uh, we have that data. So we, of course, could exploit that type of data to, to, to get maybe different types of measures for importance and see whether they're yeah, they generate robust results or maybe even generate an index uh, from these different uh, different measures. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. Vera, can I ask a question too? Sure. Um, I mean, there is an asymmetry between uh, parties in government and parties in the opposition here because parties in government have ministries to allocate. Yeah. Parties in opposition don't. Yeah. Uh, you're going to talk to us about that in some form? Um, no, because we are here only focusing. So um, who is in government is not in uh, part. Uh, so is, uh, the, the ministers are not, are not members of parliament, right? Ah, so yeah. nobody's, a, nobody's a member of parliament? Hmm. Because I think, I, I, so I don't want to lie to you. I think not. But uh, I'm not completely sure. But you're right. If that is the case, then of course that that should actually affect. Uh... Right. So no, I mean that would be because I I I appreciate that in other countries outside of the you know, UK you have to be an MP to be a minister. Here, in other countries you don't. But I wasn't aware that it was so extreme. Um, normally, some members of parliament are 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 part of a government. Um, but this is a really this is a really sorry, really good point. Um, so I really should, uh, yeah, I have that data, so I know who's uh, who's minister and who's exactly, not. Because right? because because then suppose that you had suppose that there was discrimination against women, that you might actually end up seeing more, relatively more um, women in uh, in the government benches mm -hmm. in high you know, important community simply because the best jobs are being given. I mean, assuming being a minister is a higher level job, right? I mean, it could be that being the chairman of uh, of a certain committee is better than being a junior minister in, in a minor ministry, right? So yeah. uh, anyway. 
Yeah, yeah, this adds another level of complexity, but at least we should uh, we should definitely check for this and control for this. Absolutely. So thank you for this point. No, we haven't done this so far, but we clearly have that data. So this is really straightforward to do. Yeah, great. Um, and then, of course, we look at hierarchies within committees. So this is just uh, the first uh, uh, step at uh, actually looking at uh, how, uh, what the share of bills is that is allocated to different uh, uh, committees. And sorry, this is in German because our data is in German. So you basically have um, the highest share is goes of course into the judicial committee because you, uh, for almost every proposal, um, constitutionality has to be checked. Right, so that's why it's going into. But the, the law and judicial committees are usually very special because you almost only have experts in those uh, committees. So people that had a judicial um, uh, have some judicial expertise. Um, then you Sorry, have domestic. Vera, can yeah. I ask a question just re exactly about that? So I was just wondering about whether you can get a measure of the match between the person's expertise and the expertise yeah. required. We do that. Yeah. We do that. I show I show you in a second. Yeah, we do that. So, but this kind of, so we have basically finance, economics, uh, relatively at the top, culture, education, family, um, uh, uh, migration, relatively at the bottom. So this kind of, at least at the first glance, confirms our initial or everybody's expectations, I uh, assume, uh, what are high profile and more low profile committees. Um, okay, but we are we are using we are developing this measure f further. It just take it's just taking a little bit longer to get all the data than than we had thought. So yeah, so this is exactly uh, what you were asking, right? So um, so we have many variables on education um, at the moment. We uh, just look at the attainment of a doctoral degree. But uh, we haven't yet uh, coded in what area the PhD is, which would also then be a, we would be able to match that to issue areas of the committee. Then uh, for the expertise, that's exactly your question, Valeria, uh, is that from um, the CVs, we have their previous occupations. Um, they are classified uh, or we classified them into occupational groups. We use the German Labor Office uh, classification for this, but these are, it's just because they're in German, that's why it's easier, but these are equivalent to the ISCO classifications of the International Labor um, Organization. So we actually coded them at the five digit level, right? So that means we actually can code very, very specific occupations like farmers, nurses, primary school teachers, and so on. And we can aggregate them up to more broader um, uh, 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 occupational classes. So, um, so what we then did is we are using the two digit level. So these are 37 main occupational groups and match them to the issue areas of the, uh, of the committee uh, denomination. So for example, a farmer goes into the agriculture, has expertise for an agricultural committee, a lawyer or a judge is, uh, has expertise or has, matches the expertise of law and judicial committees. Um, uh, uh, somebody who was a policeman or is a policeman has, uh, has expertise for domestic affairs, banker, finance, teacher, education, and you, you get my trust, right? So, so that was um, more straightforward as I, than I thought it would be to be able to actually match those uh, individual occupations to um, expertise in different uh, uh, committee issue areas, right? Yeah, Nelson. Um, an idea from the CVs, uh, can you code if there's substantial overlap between the ones that get selected and the rest of the party? If you have the years where they worked and when they studied? Because maybe the selection mechanism goes through uh, men used to know each other more because they studied at the same time in the same place, and maybe females didn't do it as much. So if you have the years of where they were educated, uh, where they work, maybe you have a sense if they knew each other from before. And maybe the mechanism goes through these connections. I'm just thinking of the UK, uh, all of them went to Eton and they know each other from Eton or Oxford, right? So maybe there is some of that going on here. 
it might be it's of course state parliaments and of course people go away to study but yeah so the, so i think this is a nice idea to look at network effects and whether they are stronger between uh, uh, within male uh, male parliamentarians than female parliamentarians right so so this would be nice to understand um but uh, mind you, uh, there is not so many that have university degrees or have basically studied at the same university because in Germany you still have uh, this very strong dual vocational training. So not everybody goes to university who ends up in uh, in parliament. Um, when I look through this, there's kind of an, a relatively nice balance uh, between academics and non-academics and this of course tilts to more towards academics in more recent times right you had many more farmers in in Bavarian state parliaments in the 50s and 60s and 70s than you do have now right so, uh, but yeah but that's a great idea to look at networks yeah um, that uh, I have noted this down and then we look at experience in terms of number of uh, legislative spouts, so whether people have been re-elected re and served before, um, number of previous um, uh, uh, committees, and also whether you have previously served on the same committee. So um, one of the things that's interesting or that we want to do is also, uh, uh, and we have the data just collected, whether people actually have political experience before, right? So whether they actually served at uh, at local level parliaments um, uh, or um, executive uh, committees uh, at local levels or whether there were mayors and things like that, right? So this is something that we are still collecting. And so it's not yet in the analysis. Um, so this is kind of just uh, what we have in terms of individual occupations. So what you see is like teacher, you see civil servant, you see mayor, you see lawyer, you see um, secretary, um, um, uh, nurse, and so uh, journalist, judge, and so on. Right. So this is kind of what we have uh, um, pulled out of the CV data. All right, so uh, in terms of estimation, so there's a lot to do here, as I said before, um, especially since, of course, uh, there, there, there needs to be some, we need to take better account for the fact that if you serve in one committee that might, depending on the size of your faction and so on, might increase or decrease the probability of serving in a different committee at the same time, right? And so at the moment, we only do seemingly unrelated questions that allow for uh, common error processes. Um, um, so the, the heteroscedasticity part of this problem is accounted for, but not the potential effect on estimates part of, uh, of the substitution or, um, or um, uh, what's the other one? Substitution, and you know what I mean. Or oh, whether it's increasing the probability on serving on other committees as well, right? So, um, so our dependent variable is whether you are a member of a certain committee. And then we look at these individual level uh, effects um, uh, that are gender and by gender, we look at expertise, experience, education, uh, number of children, uh, party affiliation, um, and so on. And we have state-based controls. We also use uh, state fixed effects, but we have a lot of, of course, uh, state level controls that also vary over time. For example, um, uh, um, different uh, uh, electoral institutions, um, we control for an east-west uh, effect because of course you could imagine that once uh, East German uh, state uh, parliaments after 1990 actually were established that uh, there might be a different attitude towards, um, you know, equal opportunity in committee assignment between men and women. Um, then on the second stage, we look at committee chairs, and of course, it is uh, uh, it is uh, 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 driven by a selection process. So, in order to become a chair, you have to be first uh, assigned to be a member of uh, of a certain committee. So, we do uh, just very straightforward Heckman forward forward selection model to predict committee assignment, and then in the second stage, we use uh, the predicted non-selection hazard. Um, to predict uh, chair committee chair assignment, um, 
But we, in the second stage, we believe that all institutional variables actually account for whether you are assigned to a committee, but not whether you become chair. And so we use those as exclusion restrictions uh, might not be very clean at the moment, but, uh, but I think this, this, uh, this is a first good step at the selection mechanism. Okay, I'll show you some, this is just descriptive results. Uh, this is just the share of women in state parliaments over time. Uh, you can see it varies quite a bit, but uh, you over, you're as expected have an upward trend in all state legislatures over, over time. Now to, oops. Oops, oh, my computer just failed on me. I'm sorry, opening this again. Can you see this? Is my screen still shared? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, sorry about this. Yeah. Oh, no, doesn't want me. <laughs> Not sure what is, ah, now we go. So. These, these pictures are um, used so much, yeah. Okay, I might need to open this with a different, uh, Bear with me. It's okay. Okay, I think this is the right page now. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think they they take so much. Uh, <laughs> um, Space these figures. So, so just also still descriptively, what what I'm showing you here is over an underrepresentation of women in uh, in committees. So, um, underrepresentation means that the share of women in that committee is smaller than the share of women in the state legislature at in this uh, legislative period. And so I averaged here over all periods, and you see the 16 state parliaments. Um, uh, at the um, x axis, right? So, what you can see here, so where we call econ and finance just a, as an example, high profile committees. And you see that, except for the small Saarland um, in, uh, uh, and for uh, Berlin, you have across all, on average, across all periods, um, you know, uh, you have. Uh, women are underrepresented in the finance committee and the effect is uh, in the eco uh, economics committee and the effect is even stronger in the finance committee, right? So, and uh, and uh, in the finance committee is even quite strong, right? So there are uh, more than 10% uh, uh, less women in uh, the finance committee on average than in, uh, in the state parliament. Okay. Percentage point, sorry. Um, on the other hand, these are the low profile committees. We pick family uh, and culture just uh, you know, to show you the result. Um, and you see in the family uh, committee, uh, women are way overrepresented as, as compared to their share in the state legislature. And it's a little bit more mixed uh, in the um, culture committees, but uh, uh, here women are also on average um, overrepresented. Right. So just descriptively, this actually kind of is good to know that our data um, acts as we would expect that women are underrepresented in uh, high profile committees and overrepresented in low profile committees. 
and you get a relatively similar picture when you look at the chair positions in these committees, right? Again, uh, they are mostly in terms of chair positions underrepresented in economics and finance committees, um, overrepresented in the family committee, right? Um, and then the culture committee is a little bit mixed here. Maybe the chair position is more desirable. Okay, so, um, so these are um, showing you some of the marginal effects that uh, we thought are interesting. Here you again have on the um, top, you have the finance committee and on the bottom uh, panel, you have the economics committee. This is membership going with expectation, red and orange are women and blue and light blue um, are men. Um, uh, I'm sorry, there's, uh, this is misspelled. This is not experience, but expertise. So this is exactly the variable where we match the occupational um, background um, to uh, the, uh, the area, the issue area of the committee. Um, and so what is striking is, first of all, unqualified men always, always, always have a higher probability of being in that committee than um, unqualified women, right? And uh, in the economics committee, they're uh, independent of uh, the time, right? Uh, the experience and also the uh, share of women in the state parliament, uh, men who are not qualified for the job still have a higher probability of entering that committee than women that are qualified for the job, right? So um, this is for the uh, economic committee, but for the finance committee, expertise is also important for women, right? When you compare the uh, red, the dark red and the dark blue lines, you don't have, uh, so the, the confidence intervals are a little bit larger because you don't have so many women that actually have that expertise. But once they have the expertise, they are almost as likely as men to enter this um, committee, okay? Does this make sense? Okay, because I'm running out of time, I'm showing you the same for the low profile committee. Um, and here you see that um, um, men always have in the family committee um, a lower probability of uh, entering than women. If the share of women in the state parliament increases, then okay, men don't have to take these uh, jobs anymore, right? So there are enough women to be sent from all parties into, into, the, uh, into the family committee. And, um, and expertise, again, only makes a difference for men, but not for women. Um, exper uh, uh, expertise, yeah, so this is the occupation available yeah, that you see. Um, it's a little bit more mixed again in the culture committee, uh, but again, here women are on average always overrepresented uh, and men um, uh, are um, less likely to be sent to be members of the cultural committee. Um, okay, so um, interestingly, but before we actually consult for expertise and experience, uh, Children made a difference, especially for women entering the family committee. But once we actually include um, previous experience here, so occupational experience, then uh, this has, uh, has not an effect. Children don't have an effect anymore. And uh, this is just the second stage of the Hackman selection model. And the one thing that I want to show you is that um, here, uh, there is so when you when you uh, look here, then you see a clear leftover gender effect, right? Uh, despite controlling for um, expertise, experience, and uh, education, um, especially in the finance and economics committees, but uh, so their women are still underrepresented, even when we control for competence, experience, and expertise. Um, and they are overrepresented in education, family, and culture committees, right? But this, you don't find uh, gender effects anymore um, when once you have actually conferred for committee membership and then look at chair assignment. And here, really, 
Thema Ex äh, Exper äh, Expertise ist, äh, das ist actually, ja, yeah, I'm sorry, das ist Expertise, not Experience, so Occupational Expertise. And this actually then, once we enter the committee, makes a difference for becoming the chair. And ex again, except when it comes to the family committee, their um, women are overrepresented, right? Okay. So uh, since I'm running out of time, I want to leave a couple of uh, minutes for uh, more uh, questions. This is kind of just uh, summarizing what I presented. Um, and so, uh, okay, there's still a lot to do, right? We have nice data. We haven't actually extracted everything yet. Um, since we have so much data, we can actually um, propensity score match on all the personal characteristics for men and women. So this is something that, uh, that we can do in order to, you know, increase potential identification and battle threats to identification. Um, even though the, it is hard to um, to think about whether you know you would actually study a certain subject area in order to enter the the, com the finance committee, or whether you would actually be a lawyer first in order then to later enter the, uh, the judicial committee. But yeah, there is still, of course, not much uh, that we have done to um, accept, of course, for all the fixed effects to to help identification. Um, and we still have quite a few things to do uh, in order to improve measurement of education experience and previous political careers, as well as uh, kind of the salience of and importance of different committees. So uh, I think uh, I stop here and thank you very much for listening and already for, for all the suggestions you gave me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. Yeah, Vera is going to stop the recording now and then.